I'm Michael Donna, and you're listening to Oregon Rainmakers on KLCC. On this edition, we talk with Sarah Maderi, the city manager for the city of Eugene. As the CEO of the city, Maderi has a lot on her plate and a lot of bosses on the city council to work with. Sarah Maderi, the city manager for the city of Eugene, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Super excited to be here. As I said, it's my first time in this studio <laughs> in all the years I've lived here. <laughs> well, it's it's great to have you. You know, um, maybe just talk sort of generally when you got started, what got you interested in, in working in government? Wow. Well, I actually moved to Eugene to enter the landscape architecture program at the University of Oregon, and I didn't have an interest in working in government. Okay. I had an interest in doing landscape architecture. Uh, but really loved the parks in Eugene. And when I graduated and needed employment, Mm -hmm. I reached out and uh, applied for a job in parks and was hired. So I just, it was more of a a love of place. It fit with my landscape background. And that's how I ended up here. Huh. That seems like a a, a discipline that that, that sort of is is kind of a nice strategic blend of both art and and even science. You know, did that kind of, uh, are you a creative person? And so landscape architecture was kind of, you know, helped scratch that itch of being a creative person? Yeah, I would say uh, creativity falls in one of my top five core values and something that I practice daily. Hmm. Uh, both in my job and problem solving and also just still drawing and, and doing things with my hands. I would, you're the first person that has ever said landscape architecture makes sense for this work. <laughs> uh, most people say, wow, do you miss doing that? And, and I always say this is actually kind of the perfect job. Huh to uh, take landscape architecture and, and implement it on the ground. Well, and, and certainly I think that, you know, for, for, for both native Eugenians as well as people who've moved here, you know, obviously the idea that this city um, has so many parks and, and so many, you know, kind of green spaces, I imagine, you know, through your, you know, career at, at Eugene, that must have been always at the fore of your, of your thought process. It's definitely one of the reasons I moved to Eugene. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was picking a school, I didn't know anybody that lived here. Uh, But my first visit to Eugene, I very clearly remember driving in and seeing the Fifth Street Market and thinking, what is that special place? Mm. And then just all of the parks and opportunities, uh, the river, uh, possibilities of fishing. There were so many things that just made this um, very idyllic place to to come to school and then to to live. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so you've been sort of with the city for quite some time. Talk a little bit about sort of your growth through the various departments and maybe even, you know, if there were particular mentors or or, or whatnot that sort of, you know, helped you in in, in your career and and your trajectory upward towards the top staff job. Okay, you said 20 minutes. This <laughs> Buckle up. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, I did. I started in uh, parks maintenance and thought I would be here for just a short amount of time. In fact, I remember people saying, you know, like all the things I needed to do to prepare for this long career. And I kept saying, I can't imagine that I would be here that long. Hmm. Uh, but really fell uh, totally in love, not just with the place, but with the people and the the community service. And I had never understood how special that would be to serve a community. So I've worked, we, we have six departments, I've worked in four of them, uh, had a lot of opportunities along the way, a lot of really great mentors and people that pushed me beyond my comfort zone or recommended jobs beyond my comfort zone at different times. Uh, a couple of those would include a gentleman named Tim Ray, who retired a long time ago, who actually took the first chance on me and hired me um, from the outside. Nobody knew me. Uh, they had some internal candidates, and he uh, brought me in, and it was it was great. And I will forever be grateful to him. Uh, Johnny Medlin, somebody that really encouraged me when I was in park operations to branch out into natural resources. That would give me an opportunity to work with the city council way back early in my career. He was right. So real a lot of gratitude there. Um, Renee Gruby, who was the LRCS, Library Recreation Cultural Services Director, who encouraged me to do a career development and recreation. Uh, to learn the other part of parks and recreation. Most cities, they're together, and here we're in, we're in two different departments. And then I would uh, give a final kudos to John Reese, mm. the last city manager who hired me as his assistant city manager, and I worked with him for his entire career here. Yeah. 
learned a lot from him. And then there's just been so many, you know, the mayors, the city councilors, all of my colleagues, coworkers, you know, oftentimes my best mentors are when I go out right now on a ride along with hmm. staff and I learn things from them in the field that I that kind of blow my mind and still continue to mentor me. Yeah. During your your career in the in the four out of the six departments at the city that you worked in, you know, were there I guess were there were there moments or or or, or elements when you're like, okay, there's things that I really like about sort of the working in, in, in government that, that work well and, and I want to keep, but there are things that I want to change. Was there sort of that, that learning process to, to, to sort of to sift out, you know, again, what makes sense for a, 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 a governmental a municipality such as a, a middle-sized city? And what are things that, boy, you know, if I get to be the, the boss that I want to I want to tweak or 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 even make whole scale changes. Yeah, thanks for that. I I think I've had that feeling in every position at the city, and I think most employees do. Like, oh, if I get an opportunity, sure. But I would say I probably felt that the most profoundly when uh, John asked me to. I was the assistant city manager, and he asked me if I would lead the planning and development department. So also be that department head for, he said six months, it ended up being six years. <laughs> I, was like, well, I must have misunderstood after the six part. Uh, but it was in that role where there was so much tension between customers and community and regulations and planning, all of that work where people where I just felt like, you know, if we ran this more like a family business, and, mm. I, and I would say that, you know, if people had a, they had a choice and they and they had to choose to come here, how would we treat them? And how do we help people um, facilitate problem solving and just be refreshing? I remember using that word, like just refreshing. So I think that was the first time where when I got in the job, I met with every employee and I understood the experiences they were having. And then I met with a whole bunch of community members, some of our biggest permit holders, people that come in the most frequently. Mm -hmm. And we're understanding the frustrations they had. And it was so, it's so easy when you just spend time and you listen and you understand and you respect each other to just find those places where you can improve. And the planning and development department, the staff that work there are so committed and they just, They've transformed over the years um, because they wanted to, not because yeah. of anything that I was doing. But I think that was probably the most profound. Okay. When I when I first took that job, people said, Did John, "Does John hate you? <laughs> like, why does he?" And I was like, "No, I love that job. Huh. I really, really loved that work." Okay. One of the things I like to do sometimes when I talk with people is this idea a little bit of, of sort of myth busting. There's mythology around city government, that it's bu bureaucratic, it's slow, so on and so forth. And I, and I want to give you the opportunity, for, especially for people who've never worked in city government, you know, and, and, and maybe sometimes that's true. But I, I also wanted to kind of, you know, talk a little bit about what you found in terms of compare and contrast maybe with private sector or other types of of, of, of of organizations, you know, how is it in terms of speed, in terms of, you know, cutting through wet red tape, those sorts of things? Yeah, I think it really depends on where you are. It's, okay. a, it's a big organization and we have, you know, very distinct different business models. So what's happening at, for example, the airport and what's happening in our human resources department. I mean, it's just very, very different. But I would say there's places where things just take a long time. Sure. And there's processes built in. So land use is a great example where, you know, where you have state law and you have local law and, and federal law and all of those things overlap in ways that sometimes make processes just take a long time. Yeah. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not great. We look for ways to kind of speed things up where it makes sense. Yeah. So some of that does feel very, it will feel very bureaucratic when we have to point to the code and say, this is why, and we can't do that. And that, that part is hard. And then there's other places where things just move really fast. A good example is, um, city hall and the negotiation we had with eWeb. I mean, Frank Lawson and I literally made those deal points in less than 45 minutes. Wow. It was just a, there's a trusting relationship, an agreement about how we're going to work, uh, both of us holding the community and ratepayers at the highest level. 
and you can just make those kinds of things happen really fast when your when your values and your goals and purpose are aligned. Well, I, you and I have talked about the new city hall, and I think it's it's fascinating because obviously, you know, you you sort of been without a home for quite some time since the old city hall w- w- was was scuttled, and and it seems like it's sort of a long time coming. And then you're right; it seems like wow, that did happen pretty fast. That you're going to be moving pretty soon. Yes, we are. It does. It that's what I mean, though. When yeah. the purpose and values and all that is aligned, things can actually move pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, for our audience, I think many people have a general idea, but maybe if you could kind of explain, sort of, as I understand it, the big difference is in, in, in how cities are run. Sometimes, and, and I think it usually is is chosen based on city size. It's when you have a city council and a mayor that kind of runs the show, and then you have this situation, which I don't even know if it's the right term, but it seems to be called the weak mayor system, of which I believe Eugene would fall into it, where it's like the mayor is is kind of I, I'm not using this right, but figurehead is often thrown around. But I think that you know you're the boss, the city manager, and so talk a little bit about the structure that Eugene operates under. So I never let the mayor say weak mayor form of government, okay. and I invite her to new employee orientation sure. to to join me and welcome new employees. I just generally don't like that term because okay. it. I think people do use it. They mm-hmm. they focus on the mayor, strong mayor, you know, weak mayor. I think the the primary difference is, you know, it's a it's a council manager form of government. Okay. Where the city council hires and fires a, a, an administrator mm-hmm. to run the the day to day organizations, and and that is and really that's at the hands of the people because that's in the charter. So the community has has voted and and agreed that this is the form of government. So. The mayor uh, plays a very important role, very influential role. You're right, um, is kind of the face of the city. That's who people want to talk to and Mm -hmm. meet with. Very few people really understand like the city manager piece. Um, So we work together very closely. You're right, the city manager by charter and you can kind of see what the powers are, you know, runs the organization like a CEO. Mm -hmm. So I play, you know, there's there's a part of the role that is, this is very public community leader role where you're you're meeting with community and trying to help understand what's happening. You're working with the city council to help them uh, plan for the future and implement. And then you turn around, you're you're implementing that and running an organization the way that any any CEO would run an organization. It's yeah. a little bit of all that. Yeah, yeah. What's it like? Um, the, my last question before we get to a break. You know, many of us have perhaps. You know, for most of our career, whether it's private sector or even even in, in nonprofits or, or, or organizations such as that, we have one boss. You have you have a bunch. You know, what's it like to, in many ways, like you said, you're the CEO, but ultimately you have a a cadre of elected officials who can hire and fire your position. What, what's it like in that sort of relationship? Well, it's really different. I mean, you really have to, like any, I think, CEO you that has a board, I mean, it's very, very similar. You have to get very comfortable um, with who you are and your own sense of self and decision making and, and, and your personal values. And then you cultivate relationships with each one of those those bosses. So I, I have individual relationships with all eight of the city councilors, and I have an individual relationship with the mayor, and then I have a relationship with them as a group that happens during meetings and work sessions. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's instead of asking one person, you know, for feedback, I'm asking nine mm. for feedback, you know, are there things I could do better? And you're, you're taking it, and, and they don't always agree. Sure. So there's sometimes where they're they're trying to implement different things, and I'm actually helping them both try to implement different things until a final decision's made. So it's 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 unique and also um, really fun. Okay. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking with Sarah Maderi. She's the city manager for the city of Eugene. We'll be right back. I'm Barbara Dellenbach, host of KLCC's Oregon Grapevine. David James Duncan is an author of fiction and nonfiction. His latest novel, Sunhouse, treads lightly on some darkness. Duncan says fiction was an easy choice for the tale. We have five senses and we have intuitions. And the form of fiction just jumped out at me at being way more appropriate to the kind of things I wanted to say about the desperation so many people are feeling at this time. David James Duncan on the Oregon Grapevine at klcc.org. 
And we're back. We're talking with Sarah Maderi. She is the city manager for the city of Eugene. Um, you know, you described, and I think very aptly, that you're 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 the CEO of an organization. And you know, in in some ways, you know, people can view a city as as like a business. I remember talking to a city manager years ago, and and he had told me, yeah, you know, we're like a business, and our product is ordinances and laws and and, and so on and so forth. But I I just wonder. As the CEO, you know, kind of what's your uh, both your your kind of philosophy, but also strategy about hiring people to make this, you know, interesting business go. Interesting. So at every level, I mean, I think the first there's so as I've said before, it's a it's a business of many businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of different things happening, a lot of different services being offered and and you're looking for you know the right people in each of those so I, i'm not sure if you're you're talking about at every level every employee i think at every level every employee we're looking for people that are going to be creative public service minded mm -hmm. uh, community-based you know high integrity and it is people that just generally really care we're looking at that for everybody mm. um, people that are going to serve this community well and 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 you know, just like you would want any great customer service, all of that. Okay. Uh, you know, at the at the executive level, you're, you know, it's um, you're looking for for all of those things, same things, and then you're also looking for somebody and people that are that are very team oriented. You know, not just focused on one department, but focused on the the good of all, and somebody that's going to be future oriented and you know they're they're able to we use the term about you know are you on the balcony or the dance floor you, you hmm. need to be able to do both hmm. right so when you're on the balcony you can you can see what's happening down on the dance floor if you just spend all your time on the dance floor you're <laughs> stepping up, trying not to step on people you can't you don't really notice the patterns and you okay. can't really plan for the future so we're looking for those future focused people that are that are able to um, manage departments and and solve problems but also be thinking about what's next. And you know, our fire chief, our new fire chief, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Caven, is a great example of that. Our new LRCS director, Joshua Bates, great example of that, where they have really great ideas about how to improve the organization and improve the community, you know, into the future. And they and they're just going to take steps every day to get there. Yeah, um, you know. I wonder, I imagine there, 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 whether they're either state or national organizations where you probably have a chance to talk to, to, to other city managers. And, and I'm wondering, you know, when you talk about the challenges of the job or, or the specific city you're in, how many of them are very similar? And how many of the, how many, how many perhaps of the challenges that you talk about are very unique to Eugene? Obviously, we have an issue with, with, with those that are unhoused. We have an issue with, you know, uh, uh, which I imagine may be similar to a lot of organizations where the downtown core is, has been hollowed out a little bit. I just kind of wanted to kind of get it, get kind of a, a, a you know, a, a pathway into some of those conversations about what other cities of our size are dealing with, but then the ones that perhaps are uniquely Eugene. Yeah, that's so great. So uh, two different things I'd like to share. Okay. So one, I do talk to city managers from across the country. Mm -hmm with some frequency i participate in the international city county managers association it's a it's a big association i'm a member i'm also on a couple of their i've participated in some of their task force i'm on their credentialing advisory board so mm -hmm. i work with city managers almost you know every weekend i'm looking through people's credentialing papers and, and contacting people so i do have actually a lot of contact more importantly there's seven mid-sized cities in oregon and those other six city managers and i meet with a lot of frequency, and that okay. includes Medford, Bend, Eugene, Salem, Beaverton, Gresham, and Hillsboro. Mm. Those are seven cities that are 70,000 and above that have city managers. Sure. They, I would say within Oregon, we're all, we're all um, struggling with some of the same challenges. Mm. You know, the, the actual on the ground challenges of, of public safety issues, um, issues with the un, unhoused and how you serve those and also um, help mitigate the impacts, all of that. We're all deep in that together. Across the country, that is also true. I would say this year at the ICMA conference in Austin, Texas, there were more sessions on 
on homelessness and the unhoused and alternative responses to policing than I've ever seen before. So I would say nationally, if you're if you're in a mid-sized sort of college town, we're all focused on a lot of these. I think some of the things that are uniquely Oregon, you know, some of our, our financial challenges with the property tax system are very uniquely Oregon. Not other others don't don't have those same things. They have different kinds of taxing systems, sales tax, other more resources, I think, to, yeah. to address some of those problems. But I would say um, a lot of the same issues around on the work. So we all work for city councils. We all have those same. Sure. Um, I would say we're really lucky in Eugene. Hmm. I People people talk to me about this job before I took it saying Eugene could be a really hard city to manage. And I, it, I think we have difficult issues, but I would say uh, we have such a great team and our city council is very functional. That's they're easy to work with. I genuinely enjoy and care deeply about each one of them. And not everybody that I talk to in the city manager level has that same experience. Okay. Okay. Um, when you became the CEO, the city manager, you know, maybe take us through maybe your first few council meetings. And, and what I what I'm trying to get at is those are I know many people go to city council meetings, but the vast majority of people probably haven't. Maybe they've watched them on TV, but they're they're a very interesting thing. And, and I'm wondering, you know, as as somebody who is going to be carrying out the the wishes of, of, of a publicly elected board, but then also having to be on hand to be able to answer questions and also direct staff and stuff, you know, it's a very it's obviously, you know, something incredibly important to our democracy. But boy, there are a lot of moving parts at a, at a good old fashioned city council meeting. What's it like to, to, to do your role in, in such a very public arena, if you will? Yeah, well, I'll just say my I'm not even sure I totally remember my first few council meetings because hmm. I started in November of 2019. And if you recall, <laughs> you know, we turned around in February and we were shutting down yeah. with COVID. So during that time, there's also a significant winter break. So I didn't have a lot of council meetings before we were in COVID mm. and everything really changed because we were, we were virtual. So it was kind of like a, a wipe the slate clean. We're all trying to figure out how to be city managers in this, in this time. So there wasn't really a a pattern I could follow. Okay. So what I will say is this, um, you know, being present at a city council meeting, really, you can, you really start to feel the difference. And that's one thing that I think has been hard with, with COVID and virtual is, is when you're not able to be present in the room and you can't pick up on kind of the, the body language and the side language is much more challenging to understand what's going on. Sure. Uh, but I'm there and I'm present and I'm paying attention. I'm listening. It's really, it's, it's really fascinating. We do a lot of work to prepare for them. So mm -hmm. we have both work sessions and meetings. So the work sessions, you know, we're, we're generally giving a staff presentation. We're making a recommendation or we're providing information. We're just providing an opportunity for discussion and I'm paying attention and I'm listening and I'm picking up on things and, and generally just, um, if you're just present, it, I, I don't know how else to say it. You just have to, it's a really good feeling to be there and listening and helping facilitate it. Cause that's how you're going to problem solve. Cause when you come out of that meeting, then you have to kind of follow up on the things and sure. figure out what the next steps are. That's actually the, the joy of the work. Hmm. It's really very, very fun. Yeah. Um, the meetings themselves, when it's the Monday night meetings and they're up on the dais and, and I'm sitting down there and the public's coming and talking, that's a very different experience. Okay. Um, you never really know what's, what's going to come and what people are going to be there to share. And, but it's also one of the most fascinating parts is really just listening to people and, and hearing their experiences with, with the city and the community. And we don't get everybody. Sure. So it's. You know, it's still a it's a limited selection, but um, you do you spend a lot of time listening. And I have you know my my ability to empathize with every single person coming up. 
sometimes makes this job very difficult because you're just like, oh, God, I want to make it better. Yeah. You know, that's just you want to make things better all the time, and you can't make things better for everybody all the time, and that's really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is this is kind of a toss-off question, but I always like the an- uh, hearing the answer because it's so uh, appropriate, which is, you know, what keeps you up at night? I mean, what are, the, what are maybe the one or two things that – create the biggest worry there's so many moving parts in a city and ultimately (laughs) you know the buck's going to start with stop with you so so what what are those things you know it it varies i mean right now what keeps me up at night is 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 finances you know Hmm. figuring out we have a our the buy-in so we've we've done a lot of great things over the last couple years one of the things that we've 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 sort of shifted how we're doing our financial systems we moved to a biennial budget we're trying to have a longer term focus but our biennial budget which we adopted last july so it will go through july of 2025 uh, has an eight million had an eight million dollar revenue plug put in it because we cut so many we cut so much money out already that we wanted to sit, reserve the right to like hey can we find a revenue solution here if we're not able to do that um, that's what keeps me up at night okay. is trying to figure out how do you how do you come up with the right amount of revenue in a way that doesn't impact anybody disproportionately. Or how do you reduce another eight to ten million dollars worth of services? And and at this point, with the years of reductions we've made, you know, since the even since the recession, it's hard to do that without knowing you're going to impact people. You're going to impact the community. You're going to impact employees. That keeps me up at night. Is just like how are we going to get through this? But you know, it's uh, again we have a plan. We're working through it. So I I don't tend to wake up in the middle of the night and okay. and panic. I mean, we have a plan. So sure. I I usually if I wake up in the middle of the night, I usually lay there and I start thinking about problems and solving problems, and I have really creative ideas and and it's um it's usually a very productive time. Okay. Okay. Um, my last question for you is, is actually a two part question, and and it goes something like this. You know. In your tenure as, as city manager, what's the thing you're most proud of? And then the second part of that question is, you know, before you you hang it up and, and, and go fishing full time, you know, what's the thing you'd love to accomplish? So first part, you know, what what you've already done that that you, that you feel really good about? Yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, when, when you're in these roles, you it's it's you can't really take credit for anything because everybody else is doing sure. most of the work. So mm-hmm. with that with that said, I'm I'm proud of a lot of things that have mm-hmm. happened. You know, I thought that the farmers market being uh, finally having a home for the farmers market. You yeah. have no idea how many hours I worked on that project <laughs> over the years of meeting with and it's farmers, such a signature thing in Eugene. Saturday market meeting with, and so to finally have that and have it in its original home. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, that'll just be the thing. And, hmm. and then you just realize that's just one more project. You know, really, I think what I'm the proudest of is some of the ways that we were able to pivot during COVID hmm. and the ways we've we've shifted how we serve, um, in particular, the unhoused. We still get a lot of people that want us to do more, but mm-hmm. I think some of the things we've done around safe sleep sites, uh, providing services as part of that, all of that work, I'm very proud of. Okay. Um, okay. We've really resourced the work we've done around, you know, trying to put together the housing implementation pipeline, the work of planning and development. Very proud of that. Very proud of the city hall mm. decision. Um, I know that's not totally popular. And as I've said, as a landscape architect, I could have made a really good argument for why it should be in the core <laughs> of downtown, right where we sure. were planning it. And I can make a really good argument for being on the river, but it's, it's decided, it's a smart move, it's efficient. And I think it's going to just be um, something that just is a legacy for the community that I feel really good about. I love, you know, the, the work of parks. So I don't, there's not a, um, you know, there's some things that I hope we we can we can bring together over the next couple of years. So, you know, the next step around fire governance, okay. around you know we've we've had a merged fire department for years with Springfield. It's mm-hmm. been a very operational merge, which has been great for people on the ground that are having emergencies. But there's still some administrative. So this gets to your bureaucracy <laughs> question. There's still ways in which it's two city systems that don't work well together. And I mean the systems of uh, technology okay. and, and human resource systems. I'm not talking about people. Mm-hmm. But things that just don't come together that continue to create a bit of tension in the department around 
are you a Springfield person or a Eugene person as opposed to are you a Eugene Springfield fire person? Those, those, that's a big conversation around how we bring that together and one that I'm very committed to because I think there's very few services that matter more to this community than fire and emergency medical services. And the people that are doing the work are, they, they're frustrated with it and, and they're such good employees, you want them to, to be really satisfied in the work. So that, that's really important. Um, you know, we're coming up with the financial stability and a plan for that and how we can be more proactive and, and have a stronger financial future. I think that's, that's probably the biggest for me. Okay. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you. We've been speaking with Sarah Maderi. She's the city manager for the city of Eugene. Really appreciate you coming in and talking with us. It was so fun. Thank you so much for asking me. That was our conversation with Sarah Maderi, Eugene City Manager. In many ways, the city is one of our community's biggest enterprises, and Maderi is the leader responsible for all the moving parts. This has been the Oregon Rainmakers podcast on KLCC. I'm Michael Dunn, your host. Thanks for listening.